So um, as a part of our project for International Foundation for Muslim Theology, I am one of the co-authors for a book which we hope to soon publish under the name of Revelation and Communication. So my chapter is specifically on angels in the Quran, which I'm going to have a short discussion about today. So the kind of concept of angels is the mo uh, second most important principle of faith in Islam. It comes after belief in divine unity, the oneness of God. So the Quran tells us that we need to affirm the six principles of faith, which is Allah, angels, prophethood, re revelation, revealed books, hereafter, and divine determining. And that's not just verbally, but through understanding, through tahqiq. And affirmation of God's unity is not just verbal, it requires understanding and acknowledgement by getting to know our Creator by way of manifestation of His names and attributes. The affirmation of the existence of angels also requires understanding. So we need to ask ourselves, why the concept of angels is important in Islam, and how does the affirmation and existence of angels affect my faith? But what do we know about angels, and what is our perception of angels? What comes to our minds when we think about angels? So, angelology is not considered to be scientific, so we can't see angels under a microscope. Perhaps this is why the concept of angels has been relegated to the realm of fiction, more to the realm of fiction rather than fact. Hence, the depiction of angels in fiction works of art mainly as fairies with wings and with superhuman powers. This often distorted image of angels does not pertain only to current perception, if we look at some of the verses in the Quran, such as 6.8, we see that angels were perceived by pagan Arabs to be superior to humans, as something out of this world, and definitely not humanoid. So they were surprised, for example, in chapter 25.7, and they say, what is this messenger that eats food and walks in the markets? Why was not sent down? to him an angel so that he would be with him a warner. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be, on, be, be upon him, he looked like an ordinary man and they wanted something superhuman. And in chapter six, uh, trouble, uh, trouble one, it becomes clear that as long as they have this fictional idea of angels, even if angels were sent, they would not believe because they're not really looking for the truth, but wish to remain in the world of fiction. And it says, and even if we had sent down to them the angels with a message and the dead spoke to them of it and we gathered, gathered together every created thing in front of them, they would not believe unless Allah should will. But most of them are ignorant. So let's look at the etymology of the word angel. So uh, we're looking just at the Arabic word now. The angel in Arabic is malak, similar to the Hebrew word, uh, which is derived, derived from la'aka, meaning to send on a mission. So let us see what the Quran has to say about angels. The trilateral root mam, uh, mim lam kaf, malaka, occurs 206 times in the Quran in 10 derived forms. It occurs 88 times as the noun malak, which means angels, and all the other derived forms have meaning related to power and kingdom and sovereignty, which is not totally unrelated to the idea of angels. And there's a, in Islam, a similar to Jewish and possibly uh, Christian, there's a hierarchy related to the specific functions and duties of angels. For example, we know that archangels exist. These are Gabriel, Jibrael, and Michael, Mikael, Raphael, Israfil, and Azrael. Two of these angels are mentioned by name in the Quran. These are Gabriel and Mikael, Michael, and are distinguished from other angels. 
Say who is enemy to Jebrael, for it is who who brought it down to your hearts, this Quran, but down to your hearts by Allah's permission, confirming that which was before it, and as a guidance and a mercy to the believers. Whoever is an enemy of Allah, his angels, his messengers, Gabriel and Michael, then let them know that Allah is certainly the enemy of the disbelievers. So we have to believe in angels. Gabriel brought down revelation to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Mikhail is referred to as the angel of mercy, as he is responsible for bringing down rain and thunder. Raphael, or Israfil, and Azrael are not mentioned in the Quran by name. Israfil is responsible for pronouncing the day of judgment. He is the angel of the trumpet. I believe, I think somebody mentioned as well the angel of trumpet. Uh, and Israel referred to also as Malak or Mot, that's how he's referred to in the Quran, is the angel of death. He is the one who, after death, takes the soul the nafs, nafas, also means breath, of the dead. And apart from the above, there are other angels, though again not mentioned by name, and they are tasked with particular duties, such as the hamalat al-ash, those who carry the throne. And these angels are distinguished from other angels as they are able to ask for forgiveness on our behalf, on human beings' behalf. So those angels who carry the throne uh, and those around it exalt Allah with praise of their Lord and believe in him and ask forgiveness for those who have believed. Our Lord, you have encompassed all things in mercy and knowledge, so forgive those who have repented and follow your way and protect them from the punishment of hellfire. And it mentions in the Quran that there are eight of these angels which help to carry the throne. Um, other angels include uh, um, this uh, angel called the Malik, the angel who supervises 19 other angels who guard hell. Then there are angels who, now I have to say something now, although these angels guard hell, they're not bad angels. They guard hell under the command of their creator as their duty. Then there are angels who record our deeds. I think this is what you refer to. These are referred to by their task as the honorable scribes, Kiramane Kaltibin, with the one who sits on the right shoulder recording our good deeds and the one sitting on our left shoulder recording our bad deeds. So these are with us all the time. So we're never alone. You can never say, oh, there's no one here. I'll just go and have another piece of cake. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're not alone. So we are always accountable and witnessed. Sorry, can I just ask, is having a piece of cake a good deed or a bad deed? <laughs> oh, right. It depends. If you've just had six already, then maybe not. <laughs> uh, so there's no concept of fallen angels in Islam in the sense that all angels do what they have been commanded to do. So if we look at 1815 in the Quran, we see that all angels are in total obedience to their creator. And mentioned when we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam, and they prostrated, except for Iblis. He was of the jinn and departed, Fasara, from the command of his Lord, thus insinuating that the angels didn't depart, only Iblis departed. And to Allah prostrates, also another verse, and to Allah prostrates whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. And the word that is used is ma, meaning ma, meaning everything apart from human beings, and thus expressing that nothing exists that does not prostrate, makes sujda to God. Then in 1315 in the Quran, we have the use of the word who, man. And the verse clear, clarifies that, in fact, everyone who has been given free will will also prostrate to their Lord, either willingly or by compulsion. So, at least the jinn didn't prostrate, but in fact, 
he is used by Allah, <laughs> by God, to bow that to as as a means for human beings to reach the highest level, even above angels. So in a sense, he is unwillingly made to prostrate. So the symbolic statement that all the angels prostrated to Adam, except Iblis, who was in fact a jinn and not an angel, shows that the very state or quality of angels is one of ubudiyah, means, which means worship, and one of being apt, which means servant of God. That's their quality. Also, if you look at 15.8 in the Quran, we see that angels were sent down only with the truth, with the hap. We do not send down the angels except with truth. And the disbelievers <laughs> would not then be reprieved. Therefore, there are no false messages carried by the angels. And as we know, these truths become manifest to us in varying degrees, depending on the rank and function of these angels. The truth was also sent down through revelation to Prophet Muhammad, peace be, be, be upon him, via Angel Gabriel, the Archangel, who is also understood by some exegetes to be referred to as, as the trustworthy spirit, or Ruhul Abi, and the Holy Spirit, Ruhul Quds. Angels have particular functions. So angels are assigned with different tasks and responsibilities. They are named predominantly by their function with the exception of some archangel, archangels. No angel has multiple functions. With regard to single function, example of angel of death can be given and it's single task of taking of souls and nothing else. Or the two scribes, one records the good deeds and the other the bad deeds. And the Quran says, and he taught Adam the names, all of them. Then he showed them to the angels and said, inform me of the names of these if you are truthful. So from the above verse, we see that while Adam and by extension, all human beings were taught all the names, the angels were taught only those relevant to their specific tasks. So the word Allama is used for Adam and Arada for angels, possibly, po uh, possibly because the angels cannot learn in the same way as humans can, but they manifest those names in their particular being and accordance to their specific tasks and functions. Therefore, the emphasis on Adam being taught all the names and the limited or the particular knowledge of angels related to their specific tasks clarifies that although angels are totally submitted to their particular duties, they lack the quality for being the vicegerent of God, as uh, the Khalifa or the vicegerent of God, as they do not have a comprehensive knowledge of all God's names, only the things that they are meant to be dealing with. Angels are servants and messengers of God. They are sent down to us with messages. So what are these messages? And how are they communicating with us? He sends down the angels with the inspiration of his command upon whom he wills of his servants. Telling them, warn that there is no deity except me, so fear me. So God sends down angels, not just one angels, it is the plural, malaika. Uh, with the inspiration of his command, Amr. So what is Allah's command? It is Kun, when Allah says, be and it is. And Kun, be and it is, which is one command, manifests in creation in our realm, in the realm of multiplicity, through the vehicle of angels. So what we see, one side, what becomes manifested to us, is through uh, Kun, which manifests in the realm of multiplicity through the vehicle of angels. So all that we see is manifest as the carriers of Amr, of command, or, or, or the angels. The battery is low. So here the emphasis 
is on angels being inspired by dint of their very mode of existence to bring down God's commands from the unseen world to the visible world. The word sends down, Yonazilu, comes usually with the word heaven, Asama, uh, thus indicating from above to below of the or the for, or from the realm of Malakut, the spiritual realm, to the realm of Mulk, the material realm. Chapter 32.5 in the Quran clarifies that each matter, each Amr from, from God, comes down from the heaven to the earth, to the Alp, under the lordship, under Rububiya of God. He arranges each matter from heaven to the earth, then it will it will ascend to him in a day, the extent of which is a thousand years of those which you count. Um, so it comes down and it always goes back to God. Chapter 32, 5 of the Quran thus clarifies that each matter, each Amr, comes down from the heaven to the earth under the lordship of God. Thus every command points to everything that exists. Every blade of grass, every grain of sand, and every drop of rain all appear under the command of God through the vehicle of angels. Therefore, since every command is carried by an angel, then there can be nothing in existence that is not witnessed by an angel. And there's nothing in existence that does not point to its creator. Affirmation of angels then equates to confirmation that all that exists is the manifestations of God's power and will. Apart from witnesses, angels as servants of Allah are set down as messengers and warners. Or do they think that we hear not their secrets in their private conversations? Yes, we do. And our messengers, Rasulna. Messengers are with them recording. And they have made the angels who are servants ibad of the most merciful. But, but verily over you are appointed angels to protect you, hafizim. So the Quran refers to angels as the hafizim who have been sent down to warn and protect us. They are messengers, rusul. Then they must have something to tell us. Their purpose is to communicate. Allah, God tells us to read the signs in creation in so many verses in the Quran. And angels as messengers, therefore, must be the means by which we are able to read these messages or signs in the correct way. Angels cannot mislead us because, as the Quran tells us, they are servants of Allah. Allah, which means they are totally submitted to Allah and carry out his commands in, a, in accordance to his decree. The emphasis in Muslim theology is on divine unity, which is the first fundamental of belief. In fact, everything centers on the notion of the transcendent God, who is non-material, indivisible, non-corporeal and atemporal. And yet, according to the Quran, he is closer to us than our jugular vein. How can God be nowhere and yet present everywhere at the same time? The answer is that we can never know God's essence, but we can know him through the manifestation of his names, al-Asma al-Husna, as reflected in his creation through that flower, conveyed to us through the vehicle of angels. There are many verses in the Quran, as I said, pointed to creation as signs to be read. Indeed, within the heavens and earth are signs for the believers. And in the creation of yourselves and what he disperses of moving creatures are signs for people who are certain in faith. So everything in creation is a sign, is an, is an ayah, is an indication communicated by God to be read and acted, acted upon. We need to read that rose. We need to read that tree. What is it saying to us? We need to read the feelings that happened to us. We need to read why we got angry today. 
and reflect upon that. Everything is a sign. And God's angels have been tasked to carry out God's commands by making his signs manifest to us. Angels are therefore very much involved in the life of human beings and are the means by which God communicates with his servants. They are the carriers of signs in Ayatikoni sent down, which are not just to be read, but to be internalized. To summarize then, angels are the embodiments of Sunnatullah, the codes of law pertaining to creation. They are everywhere, in every command, and in a state of prostration in the service of their creator. They are very much part of human beings' lives. Therefore, there's no such thing as Mother Nature. There's no such thing as luck. Angels as God's, God's slaves, messengers and warners are the vehicle by which God's names are manifested in the realm of multiplicity. Belief in angels means seeing beyond the form and seeing everything in creation from the inanimate beings such as stones to trees, animals and everything that happens in our lives as a missive, a sign from the sustainer and nourisher to be read. Seen in this way, our whole view of the universe changes.